Um, thank you for coming. My name is Jim Walsh. I'm the medical director of the Addiction Recovery Service over at Ballard, and we're going to talk today about methadone. Um, the, the, the real motivation for this talk is so that people know what they need to know to safely administer methadone, but we'll talk a little bit of how methadone became a common therapy, some of the rationale for methadone maintenance therapy, some of what it, it, the, the reasons, uh, the risks and benefits of giving it to pregnant people as well. We're going to start way back. So opiates have been used for a very long time. Since really the earliest recorded history in the ancient Near East, people are taking the opium poppy and gathering it for its uh, mental properties. These are the opiate pods. People would scar them and collect that goo. The, as the name somniferum suggests, people would find it help with sleep or cough or, or diarrhea or a whole variety of health problems. Hippocrates spoke very highly of the use of opium way back when, and Alexander the Great spread the use of opium through really out the, the known world at that time. And these areas are still some of the major places that poppies are, continue to be grown today. Paracelsus is considered one of the founders of Western medicine, introduced the alcohol extract of, uh, of opium known as laudanum, uh, promoted by Dr. Sydenham, who's, uh, who's, one, who's often described as England's own uh, Hippocrates. And he had a lot of positive things to say about this. With the invention of laudanum, the alcoholic extract of the opium plant, this becomes a commercial product for the first time and meets modern industry. The Germ German chemists in 1803, as they're learning about alkaloids, the bitter molecules that are most active drugs, uh, were able to isolate the morphine molecule. And it wasn't uh, shortly after that that people got the idea that you could inject this. And uh, kits like this were available really not just for physicians, but for people in general through mail order catalogs. Heroin's invented shortly thereafter a modified version of, uh, of uh, morphine. Heroin was, gets its name as the heroic medicine, which is in some ways was supposed to spare people of the, the troubles of morphinism. It was thought in many ways as a, as a cure for morphine addiction. And was promoted by our friends at Bayer as a sedative for coughs and, and a lot of other things as well. You know, right up there with aspirin, another wonder drug that's worked wonders. Um, and this is an ad from 1874. Um, by the end of the 1800s, people are starting to notice trouble. Opiates, like cocaine, available in common over-the-counter patent medicines, often very inexpensive medicines, and were used fairly widely, if not universally, uh, in, a, in the United States as well as in England. So this is a, a, a front cover of Collier's. This actually says, I think that says laudanum right there, trying to give people the sense that these patent medicines are dangerous. Um, the growth of these patent medicines led to the requirement for prescriptions. Prior to this, prescriptions were not required for medications. Doctors would use bad handwriting and secret Greek codes so patients wouldn't know what they were getting, so they'd be forced to come back to the doctor. I follow that bad handwriting tradition today. Um, but uh, um, uh, it was really with this scare that prescriptions were first required. And then shortly thereafter, this law was passed. Now, this is William Dry Br Jennings Bryan. He's the spearhead of this law. He's actually the guy who later on went on to lose the Scopes Monkey trial. He was a senator at the time. The Harrison Narcotic Act was really passed to keep uh, Chinese immigrants from importing opiate. It was part of the kind of racist backlash. But within four years of its passage, it's reinterpreted to make it illegal for doctors to prescribe opiates. And this was a really radical transformation of American medical practice. Remember, early, uh, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, opiates are over the counter. Suddenly, you need to get a prescription for them. And every doctor, every single doctor, had lots of patients on prescription opiate medications. Many of them were elderly people who started patent medicines. A large percentage of Civil War veterans were taking opiates. And doctors were prescribing this routinely. And in 1918, as this law was re-evaluated by the Supreme Court, all that became illegal. A lot of doctors fought that, thought that was uh, unconscionable. Conscionable. And a number of people actually went to jail, and several thousand doctors were incarcerated in the 20s and 30s because they continued to prescribe opiates. Sometimes not wisely, but sometimes as kind of a civil disobedience. This, uh, the last gasp of this was in Louisiana. There was a community that paid a doctor to take care of all their elderly opiate addicts very successfully. The Bureau of Narcotics shut that guy down. And in the 30s, for several years, there was a morphine clinic running out of the Lower East Side, which was shut down. Um, but generally, these were thought to be better than what was done subsequently, which was the legal system. So in 1914, 1918, opiates uh, are no longer available to addicted patients through the medical community, and people 
uh, to start to get them illegally, and the illegal growth of opiates becomes very marked. This is one of the few places in the country where opiates could be obtained by a physician, the Lexington Narcotic Farm. This is where you could go to detox. If anyone's read Junkie, um, uh, our, our man uh, William Burroughs has gone here. There's a similar facility, much smaller in, in uh, Texas, but people from all over the country would come here to, to take, a, take the cure, as it were. They'd get several days of opiate medications. They would stay here for months. And people did pretty well, but the relapse rate was well over 90%. There's another picture. It really was a farm, as you can see from a distance. Some people would work at the farm. Okay. Methadone is isolated by German chemists in 1939. At the time, it's used really as a substitute for morphine, which was getting hard to get to in those days. The Lexington Narcotic Farm, where a lot of research in opiates was, was done, started to use methadone for a very short detox in the 40s. And so it became something that people researching the field knew about. Which brings us to this lady. This is one of the founders of methadone treatment. Dr. Nicewander was a psychologist, a therapist, and she got her training through military services. It was common in those days. And while she was a member of the US Public Health Service, she was posted at the Lexington Narcotic Farm, where she met people dealing with opiate addiction. She later goes on to found a street front, really psychoanalysis clinic in New York City, and publishes a book with the very radical title in 1956 of the drug addict as patient. Psychotherapists at the time were going to great lengths to try to avoid thinking of drug addicts as patients. And the Bureau of Narcotics made the very official policy that drug addicts were not patients, they were in fact criminals. Okay. This man, Dr. Dole, who's really called the founder of methadone maintenance, read Dr. Nicewander's book and was very impressed. He is not a psychiatrist or an addiction specialist. He is a, 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 an internal medicine physician who studies metabolic pathways. He did some of the early research into the metabolism of creatinine. He got involved in the research of obesity and, um, and the rates of metabolism. And in his research, they would take people to the hospital and put them on very restricted diets or very liberal diets and measure their metabolism. And that's the way he was used to working. So he uh, became the head of the Rockefeller Institute, a Rockefeller Hospital. He talks about every day driving from the suburbs into New York City, being aware of heroin addiction. And when they tried to research this, he used the techniques that were familiar to him. He brought some people who were heroin addicts. He brought them into the hospital and let them have pretty much the opiates they wanted to have. Heroin was used. Morphine was used. They were very disappointed in the results. They found people didn't think about anything other than their next injection and were perpetually unsatisfied with the dose they were getting. They were lousy and bad. And then they tried methadone because of the history at Lexington, and they were astounded at the results. They went on to get married. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that lovely? So, uh, so this is the origin of methadone treatment. Let me tell you about, uh, let's leave the picture, the, uh, the first two patients they had, their first two heroin addicts. It, it's interesting, the origin of methadone treatment in the hospital has a lot of parallels to the origin of Minnesota model alcohol treatment, in the sense it started in a hospital setting in a very restrictive setting. These were locked, secured units with careful barriers, right? And they found that after they started the methadone, these, these were no longer needed. They noticed it was working when their very first patient started to paint again. He'd been a painter, because while they were allowing him to have heroin and morphine, he sat on the couch. But when they gave him the methadone, he started to feel, and they were very impressed with the quality of his painting. Their second patient, as he started to feel better, really asked about if he could get his GED. He wanted to go back to school. He, in fact, got his GED. He became an aeronautical engineer, very successful. Now, the painter um, was, was stable on methadone for five or six years. When he thought he didn't need it anymore, he stopped his methadone and relapsed. And that'll be a theme that we hear about later. Went back on the medicine and did well. This expanded, let me go back a second. This expanded very quickly. The first two patients did remarkably well. They published when they had six patients. They expanded to 30 patients. Then they made a deal with Beth Israel Hospital. New York City funded it, and very quickly we were serving several thousand patients. Starting methadone in the hospital, then kind of seeing it as a place to sleep while people um, would go out about their daily business, and very quickly evolving the outpatient methadone maintenance that we're familiar with today. What they discovered was that methadone in these kinds of doses, not very small doses, around 100 a day, would relieve craving from opiates, so people would be able to think about other things. It would suppress withdrawal for over 24 hours, which meant you couldn't give it once a day. And most importantly, it would block the effects of other opiates. So patients on methadone maintenance, if they used heroin, would not notice any effect. At the same time as the patients were not euphoric, not sedated, and didn't get any special pain relief either, they were in fact normal. There was a lot of fear that patients would be narcotized, as they used to say, or sedated, unable to drive safely, unable to work, and none of this was found to be true. 
they found that the lowest effective dose for methadone maintenance was 60 milligrams a day. Now remember, the, the key to me, the effectiveness of methadone maintenance is this, that it blocks the effects of other opiates. To do that, you needed typically 60 milligrams a day. Doses less than this were shown in the very initial studies to be ineffective. But when methadone spread throughout the country, some crazy stuff happened that led to doses of 20 and 30, 40 being typical and doses over 40 being seen, seen as scary in some way or inappropriate in some way. And a lot of patients on methadone maintenance in, outside of these trials got inadequate treatment. Here's a few summary. In 1964, there's six patients. In 1998, there's, a, there's almost 200,000 patients. Now I'm sure we're over the 200,000 mark. They published some data over the first 17,000. Retention rate was very high. 35% of people who were not working got a job. And what I love is this rate of arrest, which was two people per year, uh, down to basically nobody was getting arrested. Um, but what they found is that patients who left the clinic did not do well. Uh, patients who left in good standing, which means that they're successful, they're doing well, they made an elective choice because they thought they didn't need it anymore, still the vast majority relapsed. And uh, patients who were kicked out, these are mostly people using alcohol and cocaine. The relapse rate, of course, is very high. So methadone is intended to be not a cure for opiate addiction, but a corrective therapy, a maintenance therapy. And it's not so surprising that this is developed by a doctor who studies metabolic diseases, very comparable to the way that that insulin treats diabetes, methadone treats opiate dependence. I love this quote by Dr. Dole. It's really a reflection of his early experience and showing how th as, as the addictive disorder is treated, the underlying person starts to become visible again. Um, he was a very uh, open-hearted person. I think really saw the, the individual people he was treating as, as a physician would be, would be hoped to do and expected to do. OK. Um, Methadone maintenance, when it's done well, is remarkably effective. Patients do stop using heroin and other opiates. The risk of death goes down remarkably. The risk of HIV and, and uh, other uh, bloodborne diseases goes down. Uh, arrest, employment, successful marriage, sexual parenting has been repeated again and again as successful therapy. Um, there's been trouble in it when doses are too low. Patients are not adequately blocked and continue to use opiates. But there's a real philosophical problem around methadone. Thanks. You know, in, in most forms of medication, in most forms of medicine, when we discover an effective therapy and the patient feels better, they're often ambivalent about their medicine. Often people confuse the medicine with the disease. Patients on antihypertensives whose lives can be saved by those drugs often feel angry about their medicines and want to not take them, want to get off them. We see this most dramatically in insulin-dependent uh, diabetics who are very ambivalent about their medicine. And even though the medicine is saving their life, they often want to stop it. We see this with methadone, probably more so, because the disease of addiction has a very high stigma. And people often will attach that rather than the disease to the treatment. But what's frustrating in methadone is that the medical community does the same thing. Uh, a physician who starts an antihypertensive usually encourages their patient to stay on it. Well, certainly this is true for insulin. A patient who's doing successful on antidepressants, the physician continues to stay on it. Methadone may be the only medicine where as soon as the patient gets better, uh, due to the medicine, everyone starts to ask when should the patient come off the medicine. Methadone works when you're still taking it. Methadone is meant to be a maintenance therapy. And when used in this way, it's a life-saving therapy for the very serious disease of opiate addiction. It's not a temporary affair, though. Yeah. Any questions about that? Yeah. If we're going to give methadone, we want to give it safely. And this is a real risk. Although methadone is a very effective therapy, it is not a harmless therapy. Uh, it's not at all unlikely to overdose and kill people with methadone. Okay. Why does this occur? What makes methadone an effect for treatment is the slowness of methadone. It begins slowly, so it's not reinforcing, so people don't feel compelled to abuse it. It wears off slowly, so there's not a sudden onset of withdrawal, so it works as effective maintenance. But this same slowness, which is the crux of methadone's effectiveness, also presents risk. Okay. The first number to keep in mind, if you're going to give methadone to a patient, and this is very important for nurses as well as physicians, is the time to peak effect, four hours. Okay? Which means that when you give the first dose, it's really not doing everything it's going to do until four hours has gone by. For patients at home, this is very dangerous. People who are used to taking heroin or Vicodin or Percocet will take one, and when it's not working in 30, 40 minutes, be worried and take another. And when it's not working, take another. And by the time the first dose is effective, they've taken a dangerous amount of medication. Okay? Um, 
Oh, yeah, I did it again. That's great. So while we're waiting for four hours, the blood levels are rising up, the brain effect is rising up, and most important, the degree of respiratory suppression. Now, you can deal with this if you know how much you can give safely. And there is a dose, a specific milligrams, that should be a safe dose for everybody, meaning that if the people in this room took it, they might fall asleep, but they wouldn't stop breathing. And that dose is 30 milligrams. Now, I say should, not definitely, because it's not definite. Someone who's on other medicines that decrease their respirations, like benzodiazepines or barbiturates, someone who has COPD who maybe can't handle a slightly decreased respiratory may, in fact, be in trouble. But 30 milligrams is typically a safe starting dose for most patients. Okay? And the next thing to know is the half-life. Now, we're going to talk more about half-life and how it works out here in a second. But the half-life of methadone is about a day. We're going to come back onto that in a second. But this half-life varies a lot. For certain people, it's a lot faster. For other people, it's a lot slower. Some of this is genetic. The liver has those, for people who keep track of this, the, the cytochrome P450 enzymes. There's a dozen subsets that I can't keep track of. Methadone is metabolized by several of them, but the, the levels in the different people really vary. Medicines can really affect methadone, uh, methadone uh, metabolism change things. Let's talk about half-life. Now, now, in medical school, they beat this half-life into us. And for some people, this may be less familiar. But half-life is the time it takes for the blood level, the serum level of your medicine, to drop by half. So this picture is meant to show the serum level, that's the y-axis, of a medicine when you've taken a single dose orally. It goes up gradually after the first little while, reaches a peak, and then your liver or your kidney metabolizes it. For most medications, the rate of metabolism is proportional to the amount you have in you. So the rate of metabolism gradually comes down. So you get these kind of rapid fall off of the blood level and then a gradual decrease. And this is the typical pa uh, pattern you'll see for most every medication. And this amount of time, the time it takes for it to come down by half, is the half-life. Now after a half-life, the medicine is not all gone. The medicine is only half gone. So it's still half there. After two half-lives, a quarter of the medicine is still there. After three half-lives, an eighth of the initial dose is still there. And that's where our trouble lies. Because when we give the medicine regularly, now here's a medicine being given at a frequency, an interval, equal to its half-life. OK? Right? So see, the half-life is, uh, I'm not going to worry about the time. It's five of those little lines, and we're giving a new dose every fifth line. Okay? Now, each of these lines shows how much medicine that one dose has left in your body. But it builds up. And this red line shows the actual cumulative serum level of the medication. Can you describe that using methadone? It's saying the half-life is going to be... Yeah, we're going to get there. So the half-life of methadone is 24 hours. That's this point here. The frequency of dosing is usually, not always, but usually 24 hours. That's the same amount of time. So this shows what happens on day one. At about four or five hours, the level peaks. It gradually decreases until the next morning we give the same dose again, and the level goes up higher still. Higher than it was the first day, even though the dose of the medication is the same. Okay? Then we give the third dose, and it goes higher still. Now this curve, this red curve, is really important for the patient, because what they don't want to do is end up down here, because that's when they feel sick. That's what the patient doesn't like. Right? So, and that stops happening. How lovely is that? Right? That's just the effect we wanted, right? But what we're concerned about from a safety perspective is this peak, this is what's going to kill them. This is going up day by day. Now, it won't go up forever because the time it takes to equilibrate is five half-lives. So by around the fifth half-life, okay, this is going to start to even out. It's not going to keep going up. Okay? Now, if you're giving a drug like Percocet, the half-life is four hours. So it's going to equilibrate in 20 hours. But if you get a drug like methadone, the half-life is 18 to 36 hours. We're talking three to seven days. So how are we going to overdose our methadone patients? We're going to do it in the first day by giving too much, maybe more than 30, or maybe too often, not watching four to six hours for that peak, right? That very important peak effect, okay? Or we're going to do it on the third, fourth, or fifth day. This is the one that sneaks up on you, right? I gave them 60 the first day, they were fine. I gave them 60 the second day, they were fine. Suddenly, I can't wake them up. 
I've seen this happen with great regularity, okay? So people have to watch this. With methadone or any long half-life medication, the dose that's fine on the first day can be an overdose in the third, fourth, or fifth day. And that's where we're going to get in trouble. Okay, so... Mostly you can't tell. Uh, the vast majority is going to be genetic variations. There's a lot of medicines which can have a really big impact, but even that's pretty unpredictable. Rifampin always does it. Rifampin's real trouble for people on methadone. It, it, you can ask the pharmacist to run a list of medications. There's like a, a document about three or four pages of methadone interactions, but even then it's not that predictable. If you have a patient stable on methadone and you're starting a new medicine, that's the time to check those medicine interactions. If you have a patient who's on some medicines, you're starting methadone, you don't have to worry about it so much. You just have to remember that peak. Let's see, there it is. Come on, where is it? There it is. The peak effect, four hours, I say four to six, right? Watching for that peak. And then you have to watch day by day and keep a close watch out. Now, the, resp the, the, the overdose, the excess of opiate, is, the risk of it is respiratory suppression. So what are you going to see? A patient who's a little drowsy, a patient who's unrousable, a patient who's not breathing, okay? And if you're watching their respiratory rate, you're in good shape. That's the key fact. That's the key number, okay? So 18 to 36 hours, a lot of variation. Remember, five half-lives are basically five days, three to seven days to equilibrate. There's that picture again. And then these are the three numbers. If you remember these three numbers and you stop and think, you won't, you won't go wrong, okay? And on day one, it's that peak effect, four hours. That's why when you see us write methadone, we usually write additional doses after four or six hours. Okay? Um, the half-life will tell you where you're going to be, and then you want to know what you can give safely. Any questions about that? Yeah. I'm still kind of confused about the red line. Okay. So this is the, uh, this is the serum level off just that one individual dose. Okay. This is the additive serum level. So this doesn't come down as low because this one's already coming up. Okay? This one gets higher because this medicine's already here. When we get out to this day, I've got this amount of medicine and this amount of medicine added to that amount of medicine. Okay? When I come out to this day, I got that little bit and then that little bit added to this. It's accumulating over time. Now again, this is good. It's smoothing out. Smooth is what we're looking for here. If we give the methadone twice a day, Picture these curves pushed back, and you're going to see it's going to shoot up even a little higher. Which, by day five, we're looking at the steady state. Day five is typically, five half-lives is a steady state. So if a patient's got a 24-hour half-life, it'll be five days. Sir? Mm -hmm. Oh, I understand. Okay, good. Okay. All right. So there's your three figures. The whole crux of this lecture is those three, those three numbers, and you're good. Okay. So starting methadone in the hospital, start at a safe dose. The first dose have to be, has to be a safe dose, 10, 20, or 30. We usually will give 20 or 30. We usually give 30. If there's some reason to think patients aren't using that much, occasionally we give a low dose. When to give the first dose? Now, exactly. Give the first dose now. This is different than the Suboxone, obviously, where the timing of the first dose is a really big deal. Why do we want to give it now? Because the opiate they took is probably Percocet, Vicodin, smoked Oxycontin, or heroin. It's probably wearing off really fast. And our methadone's kicking in really slow. So we want to get going on that. We want to give it now. They don't have to be in withdrawal by any means to give the first dose. If you know they're going to be in withdrawal, don't wait for it. Go ahead and give it. Okay? Okay. Wait for the, once you've given that first dose, then watch and see what you got, four to six hours. And you can give additional methadone cautiously because it's accumulating. You're laying doses on top of doses, right? When I say cautiously, what I basically mean is every four to six hours, keeping an eye out for overdose. Overdose in this case means specifically reduced respiratory rate. More, right? Okay. Think about the accumulation of blood levels and adjust the dose daily. Somebody who gets 90 on the first day, who looks perfect, who looks great, probably isn't going to be on 90 every day. That probably will be too much. Okay? Watch for signs of overdose. Watch for signs of withdrawal. And communicate early. Because methadone is a very slow medicine. Trying to fix someone's opiate withdrawal with, with, with methadone is trying to like move a block with a, with a rubber band, you know? Picture a block on the table, you pull the rubber band, it doesn't move at first, right? It doesn't move, it doesn't move. And then as soon as it starts to move, it tends to overshoot. 
That's how methadone is. Okay? So you've got to really pay attention, and you've got to be thoughtful about how you're adjusting doses. So you might overshoot, and then you might, you might let that tension go. You might back up that dose as soon as it starts to get a little bit better. Okay? So communicating early and thinking about changes over time are really, really important. Any questions about that? Okay. Let's talk about methadone in pregnancy. Now, I've been trying to be very factual and very scientific. That won't be so true now because there's not enough scientific facts. But we do know this. Opiates are not harmful to pregnancies. Okay? If you're uh, pregnant, you go to the dentist, they'll give you oxycodone. There's no big deal. Nobody thinks anything about it. Now, that's not to say that they don't go into the baby. But there's a lot of chemicals that we take that get into our baby. Our food gets into our, the baby. Actually, I, I don't have a baby. I'm a boy. But uh, the food gets into your baby. Tylenol goes into a baby, right? Benadryl goes into a baby. Amoxicillin goes into a baby. Doesn't seem to cause any harm, even though it does penetrate the baby's brain, OK? We do know that opiate withdrawal is harmful to developing babies. So if you take opiates every day, if you take enough opiates every day, that when you stop them, you get sick, that you go into withdrawal, this we know is harmful to babies. We know it causes miscarriages in the first trimester. It causes preterm delivery. And it can cause a fetal demise, which is basically the same as a miscarriage, but later in their pregnancy, often called a stillbirth, which is one of the most tragic things that a, that a parent can go through. OK? So let me come back to this. How do we know these things? I would, sir. Dr. Moss, if uh, the mother is overdosed, is the baby overdosed? N well, yes. But remember, the cause of death of overdose is not breathing. The baby doesn't have to breathe. So it doesn't matter that the baby, in fact, the baby doesn't breathe for most of the pregnancy, right? So if the mother stops breathing and her oxygen level drops, that's very bad. If you put the mother on a ventilator or give her oxygen or wake her up, then the baby's fine. The baby does not have to breathe. So taking excess opiates only hurts the mother to the extent it hurts the, hurts the baby to the extent it hurts the mother. But the withdrawal affects the baby. So how do we know these things? You know, there are not randomized uh, trials of putting pregnant women through opiate withdrawal, but there's experience. So in the early days of methadone, when they were first using methadone maintenance, if a woman got pregnant, she was told to stop taking the methadone. Now, withdrawal from methadone can be really rough and last a long time, but women love their babies, and they'll do these things. So a lot of women uh, in the early days of the 70s would come off methadone abruptly, and it was noted that they had a lot of miscarriages. I can't say exactly how many. I can't correlate it to dose. I've never seen any published data. It's one of those things that, that's in the community that we know happen. Okay? We will, with some regularity, see a woman come to the hospital in acute opiate withdrawal, dilated pupils, sweating, vomiting, diarrhea, inactive labor, in preterm labor, or with a deceased baby. Here's a classic story of that. So there was a lady who was taking Vicodin pills. She lived in Spokane. She moved over here to get away. She was driving down the street one day, and the police picked her up because she was kind of weaving. She was brought to the local police station. Okay? She didn't tell the policeman about her use of opiate medications. She stayed at the police station 18 hours, and while she was there, her Percocet, Vicodin, wore off, and she went into withdrawal. She started to complain of cramping. Of course, knowing that she was pregnant, about 29 weeks pregnant, the, the uh, police uh, brought her to the local hospital, where they put the baby on the heart monitor, the, the uh, fetal monitor, and they found the baby was severely bradycardic. So what did they do? Emergency C-section. Delivered the baby at 29 weeks. Right. The cause of the bradycardia was due to opiate withdrawal. And we do know that opiate withdrawal does cause fetal bradycardia, slow heart rate. We know this happens in grown-up people. If, you, if a person's in opiate withdrawal, amongst other things that'll happen, frequently their heart rate will plummet and their blood pressure will plummet. We know this from fetal sheep. Someone's done a very nasty experiment to some sheep. They put the mommy sheep on morphine. And after several days, they gave the mommy sheep a single dose of Narcan, the opiate blocker. And the sheep went into withdrawal. The fetal sheep, which was inside the mom, had a sudden drop in heart rate and drop in blood pressure. An animal study, the only one we know. So it's been documented in animals this happens. Now, it, w for us, we get oxygen by our lungs. We have to keep breathing. The baby gets its oxygen through the placenta. Right? You can hold off not breathing for a little while, but the baby needs its heart rate and it needs its blood pressure to get its oxygen and food. So for a fetus to have bradycardia and hypotensive is potentially fatal, much more so than for us. And that's why we see fetal demises. Uh, I described, again, a case to you of a woman who, uh, who had a preterm delivery because of bradycardia. I have myself have seen at least two women who presented to OB triage in acute opiate withdrawal in the eighth month with a deceased baby. A very, very sad event. Okay. This is what we're trying to avoid.
Okay. Now, at the same time, these are anecdotal stories. Nobody knows how bad does the withdrawal have to be before it's risky to the fetus. In the first trimester, how bad is it before there's a risk of miscarriage? In the late trimester, how bad before there's a risk of early labor? Nobody knows because no one's tried to find out. There's a single human experiment. Back in the 70s, a doctor was going to taper a woman off methadone, and they were going to do serial, multiple cases of amniocentesis, you know, the needle to remove some of the baby's fluid, and they were going to monitor the baby baby's adrenaline level in the fluid, and that would be a measure of fetal distress, was the plan. So they lowered the woman's methadone dose. She had the first case of feeling a little bit of withdrawal. They did the first amniocentesis, and the adrenaline levels were off the scale. So they just stopped and put her back on methadone. That's all we know. We don't really know. Now, I've told you some cases of bad things happening. Certainly, a lot of women have stopped opiates without having miscarriages, and a lot of women have stopped opiates without having early deliveries or fetal demises. We don't know the numbers. We don't know the numbers. Okay. So this is a hard thing for people who ask this question. Is it safe to detox in pregnancy? Now, safe is a relative term. Opiate withdrawal is not dangerous to the adult. It won't kill the mom. The question is, will it kill the baby? Will it cause a miscarriage in the first trimester? Will it cause a fetal demise or preterm delivery in the third trimester? We don't really know. I talked to one doctor in Florida who, because of the legal framework that, that was there, she detoxed 30 patients, most of whom were in the second trimester, the safest time, and no miscarriages happen. So I like to conclude that in the second trimester, using a buprenorphine detox, the risk of miscarriage is hopefully less than 1 in 30. That's all I really got. You know, no one really knows. There are certainly risks, but we just don't know how high those risks are. It's definitely true the second trimester is the least risky time. People will sometimes say the second trimester is the safe time. I think that's not really what the evidence shows, but, but certainly is the least risky. Why? Why what? Oh, that's a, that's a really great question. So in the early part of pregnancy, when the placenta is just developing, a pregnancy is by nature very fragile. In any normal pregnancy, everything else perfect, risk of miscarriage, one in four at around eight weeks or so. So very, very common. So women who, who you know, if, if you're ill, we know that's worse. For a woman who's got a high fever, bad diarrhea, vomiting severely, miscarriage rates go up in the first trimester, presumably because mom is sick. It's, it's making a difference. But the third trimester is the most fragile time, and that has to do with the baby. As the baby gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the placenta does not keep getting bigger. Right? So the ratio of baby to placenta gets less favorable. Plus, placentas are made to kind of wear out. In the later part of pregnancy, little bits of the placentas tend to clot off a little bit. Right? The blood flow reduces there. That's one of the signals to go into labor, and it's probably a normal physiologic thing. But it does mean that at the end of pregnancy, the closer to delivery, the baby's under stress right? by its nature, normally. So if we add to the stress, we're adding risk. So the most risky time is probably the day before the baby's born. What's weird about this is that opiate withdrawal is less of a concern once the baby's born. The placenta is struggling to get oxygen through the baby, struggling to get enough nutrition through. Once the baby's born, it's going to get oxygen through its lungs. It's going to get food through its stomach. It's a lot easier to get those things in for a born baby than the baby just before it's delivered. So the answer is we don't know. We know there's risks, but we don't have any quantifiers for those risks. Okay. But here's some things we know, that methadone maintenance is the standard therapy, the gold standard therapy for treatment of pregnant women who have become physically dependent to opiates. Okay? Telling women like that to detox is, is doing a disservice to her pregnancy. The women typically want to detox. Now, pregnant women with drug problems usually feel very, very guilty. And one way to deal with being guilty is to suffer. And if you suffer, you expiate your sins. So the women often find very attractive the thought of going through these horrible withdrawal because they feel like they get into a better place, they're in good graces, and they kind of can move past their, their sense of shame. But that's not in the best interest of the baby, and they need a lot of help to understand that. Methadone maintenance it leads to very healthy baby outcomes, to normal baby outcomes, normal-sized babies, healthy babies, not preterm babies. Okay? After the babies are born, there is withdrawal, but that turns out to be not such a big problem. Okay? They call that neonatal abstinence, or NAS, neonatal abstinence syndrome. For mothers who have been maintained on methadone, 75%, three out of four, are going to show signs of this neonatal abstinence and need medication for it. Basically, you're talking about the babies have opiate withdrawal that we can see. And the management of this is really very simple. Nurses who are trained to do so look at the kids and look for signs of opiate withdrawal. 
how are they uh, sucking, what is their muscle tone like, how are they sleeping, what is their crying like, what's their pooping like. And just like you guys do alcohol withdrawal scores, they do a Finnegan score, named after Dr. Finnegan, who pioneered this. And the Finnegan score says how bad the withdrawal is, and if it's bad enough, they get little drops of morphine. And the, the severity of the score determines how much morphine they get, and it plateaus around three or four days, and then it comes down by itself, and it typically takes several weeks. Hospitals that do a lot of this have shorter length of stays. Hospitals that do less of it have slightly longer length of stays. That's probably not surprising. Average, probably one to three weeks. The worst I ever saw was six weeks. It was kind of a very unusual case in some ways. Um, but this goes very well. As you can imagine, methadone in pregnancy is controversial, and people have studied these kids to try to find signs of developmental impacts. And even though we know that the opiate has been in their brain, there's no evidence it has hurt them in any way. Their long-term outcomes are normal and good. They've typically done Brazelton developmental studies and not found abnormalities. So these kids are healthy kids at the end of all this. It's very hard for the moms to accept the kids in the hospital. Um, this is, I try to remind them, this is normal medical treatment. It's not legal. It's not punishment. It's to take care of the medical problem. These kids do well. It's absolutely okay to breastfeed on methadone. Now, some methadone gets into the breast milk. But the thing with, with, with most meds in breast milk is when you take a medicine, it is then diluted into your entire body. And a small percentage of the water in your body becomes breast milk. So the medicine is very, very diluted by the natural process. The amount of methadone that comes through in the breast milk is enormously less than what we give to treat neonatal abstinence. So in that sense, it can't be harmful, right? Now, kids who are on, meth on, on breastfed do a lot better through this needle and needle abstinence. They just don't get sick as much. Some people have posited that little tiny methadone in the milk helps them. Personally, I don't buy it. I think this is true because uh, breastfed kids are happier. One hospital started a rooming in protocol, right? And as soon as they started rooming the babies with the mother, the severity of the needle, uh, needle abstinence went down by half, and the length of stay dropped by half. The, the, the Finnegan score to measure the symptoms, and you guys know this who do CWIS scores, it's a fairly blunt instrument. You know, Kids who are coming off cigarettes have elevated Finnegan scores because they're crabby and they don't feed well, you know, coming off nicotine. Um, and I think anything that makes the baby happier is going to lower that score, and they're going to have less troubles. So, so rooming in, being with your mom, breastfeeding, all this makes us go a lot smoother. Okay? So breastfeeding is okay. There are studies looking at breastfeeding up to 110 milligrams a day, showing no harm. Uh, Swedish used to follow a rule of 150 milligrams a day, that above that you couldn't breastfeed. Nowadays, we don't even really follow such a rule. People have sometimes wondered, what if you stop breastfeeding suddenly? Could the baby have withdrawal? And the answer is probably yes, rarely. There's one published case from Australia showing that. I don't remember the mom's dose. I heard a case here in our local community described that seemed to fit that pattern. I don't worry about that too much because for those who've breastfed before, you know your baby will not let you stop breastfeeding abruptly. And the word weaning was not invented for opiates. It was invented for breastfeeding. So typically kids' uh, breast milk intake gra decreases gradually over many, many months, and that's probably just fine. Okay. People have asked me, what about the Suboxone or the Subutex or the buprenorphine? It, can we use that in pregnancy? And the answer is, yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. So they're doing this in Europe a lot. Europe has had buprenorphine, uh, Subutex, or Suboxone about 10 years longer than we have. So there's been more research with it. The first few cases of pregnant women on this medicine were people who were on buprenorphine for their opiate addiction who just got pregnant and didn't want to stop. And they stayed on it, and they did very well and delivered healthy babies. So this seems to go pretty well. There's been a total of 1,000 cases published, maybe more than that by now. No uh, birth defects have been noted. The kids are born healthy in every way. There, we're a little disappointed that there is still some withdrawal for babies on buprenorphine. I was kind of hoping for none. It's less than methadone if three-quarters of kids on methadone need treatment for withdrawal, half of kids on buprenorphine need treatment for withdrawal. And it gets better a little quicker, a week or two rather than, than, than three weeks. But still, it, do, it does happen. Um, there was a single study. I, I think it was from Finland. I don't remember. They had 100 women on methadone, 100 women on uh, buprenorphine. They mentioned that two of the kids who were on the buprenorphine died of SIDS, sudden infant death, later on. That was not statistically significant. No other studies have found that. It's generally assumed to have be a, a fluke. But just like when you're ever giving any new medicine to a pregnant woman, I try to tell her every bad thing I can know about it so she can make an informed choice. I always share that with every pregnant woman I'm giving uh, this medicine to. Um, 
Typically, subutext, which is the version without the, the, uh, the naloxone is given to pregnant people, it's probably irrelevant because the naloxone is not absorbed, but that's the tradition, so we follow that tradition. Um, uh, what does it tell you? The big problem with buprenorphine in pregnancy in the state of Washington is that DSHS will not pay for it. And they express that because it's new and they're worried about safety in pregnant people. So most of the women have private insurance that we've discussed this as an option are very excited about this option because they don't want to go to the clinic every day, right? Uh, but for women who are state-funded DSHS clients, as of now, this is not, not available to them. There is a current U.S. study, a nice big randomized study going on in um, uh, Baltimore at Johns Hopkins, which will probably be published next year. And I'm, I'm hoping with positive results that this will sway the state to switch over. So we might find ourselves using this more. But for those who saw uh, Dr. Hodel's uh, buprenorphine lecture, remember you have to be in a little bit of withdrawal before starting this medicine. And I just told you that withdrawal is bad for fetuses, right? So it makes how to start this a little bit tricky, right? For women in the second trimester when the risks are relatively low, probably that's fairly appealing. For women who show up at 37 or 38 weeks, I may not have the guts to do something like that. But you will definitely see more of this. Can I have you, in yeah. terms of the uh, buprenorphine, I, I know in the past there have been a couple of instances where you've actually had pregnant patients who've received this on our unit. Mm -hmm. So w why some and not others? Because they had insurance or, or financial resources, honestly, to pr pay for it. I, I'm assuming that as more safety data accumulates, particularly maybe data generated in the United States, that the state will agree that this is a healthy choice and agree to offer this choice. But for now, they will not. When, when I review the safety data, and just as I've told you now with pregnant women who have private insurance, I've never seen a single one opt for the methadone instead. And again, the reason is just the convenience of doing it at the doctor's office instead of, um, instead of at the methadone maintenance clinic. Uh, well, if you want to know more about dosing of buprenorphine, you'll want to watch Dr. Hodel's uh, buprenorphine DVD, which is really wonderful. In terms, of pr in terms of dosing for pregnant people, we dose it the pretty much the same as non-pregnant people. But, you know, the goals are kind of different. We talked about methadone maintenance. You know, 80 to 120 is the normal dose, right? 60 is the minimum dose for effective methadone maintenance, which means the minimum dose of methadone to provide adequate blockade so people can't use heroin or other opiates. With pregnant people, that's typically not our goal. With pregnant people, our typical goal is fetal safety. And we usually give the minimum dose that leaves the, the pregnant woman not in withdrawal as a guarantee of the baby's safety. This may not be an effective dose to help her be successful in the community staying sober. Right? And if she's going to be in the community and continues to relapse, typically her dose will need to be increased. But for many pregnant women, we'd rather redirect them into community treatment programs, to sober living environments. So if we have someone who's going to be out in the world where relapse is an everyday reality, they need a dose of methadone that provides adequate blockade, 60 at least, 80 to 120 typically. But if our goal is fetal safety, we use the minimum dose that makes her basically feel normal. And you've seen patients here on 7 or 8 milligrams sometime, a lot of patients on 20, 30, 40 milligrams. Again, if they're in their community, living down the street from a guy who's selling heroin, this is not going to cut it, right? But if they're going to uh, perinatal treatment services, Evergreen Manor, a safe residential setting where relapse is really not a risk, then the minimum dose is appropriate. If they're on a higher dose, the baby's withdrawal might be worse. But, you know, that's a little uncertain, actually. I say might be. There's four studies that try to correlate maternal methadone doses with the length of time or the amount of medicine the baby's needed. In two of the studies, they show a positive correlation. In two of the studies, they, did, they found no correlation between the dose and length of treatment. In fact, one showed moms on the lowest doses, babies had the longest treatment in the hospital. Why would that be true? Because those moms are probably still using because the worst thing for the baby is the up and down of intermittent opiate use. That we know is true. Right? So uh, if we have moms in residential sober environments, we'll use the minimum dose that she feels well. If we have moms, even pregnant folks who are actively using, we might raise their dose to the point that uh, opiates no longer cause a, a, a euphoric or reinforcing effect. Okay. 
If you're giving methadone to pregnant folks, a few things to remember. People at the methadone clinics know this very well, but you guys at Ballard Swedish should also know this. This is less relevant if you're starting somebody new, but a big deal if someone's on methadone and they suddenly become pregnant. Because in the first trimester pregnancy, very early, your body takes on a lot of water. Legs get puffy, veins get bigger, breasts get larger. You just get more fluid in your body, and this dilutes the methadone. And right at a time when a woman's discovered she's pregnant, happy news, really excited about staying sober, uh, she suddenly starts to have craving and withdrawal symptoms. And a lot of people relapse because of this, because they're suddenly their dose isn't holding them anymore. So it's really important to be aware of this, and a woman who's been stable on methadone who becomes pregnant often will need a slight increase in her dose. This is usually 5 or 10%. In the early third trimester, 25, uh, 26, 28 weeks, something else is going to happen. The liver is going to take it up a notch and move into high gear. It's helping get rid of the baby's stuff, bilirubin, toxins, whatever the mother's liver does for the baby. The liver is starting to metabolize things faster, and the woman's methadone levels will start falling. And again, what she'll notice is that she's feeling craving or feeling sick again. Some women will do a great thing and tell their, their counselor or their doctor at the methadone clinic and get their dose increased. But some women feel like people will think ill of them if they say that. And in fact, they relapse. And we've seen a lot of people relapse right at this juncture, 25, 27 weeks, because they were feeling sick again. Okay. So uh, the best thing would be is if the medical providers ask them, educate them, almost like anticipate this. This is very predictable. It happens in most people. Okay. Um, again, the, the increase is pretty subtle. It's not a big one. It's usually about 10 percent, maybe 15 percent, maybe 5 percent. It's a small increase that's usually necessary here, but it is relevant. Once the baby's born, all these things are going to reverse. The fluid's going to come out. Women pee a lot. Their liver's going to start to slow down. And we see a number of women who, at the same dose that left them feel very normal, very awake in pregnancy, are suddenly toxic. Uh, people at the hospital complain that she's holding the baby and she's falling asleep, you know. And this is usually a couple days, a week or two after the baby's born. Her dose needs to be brought down. Hopefully the methadone clinic is aware of this. Hopefully the patient is aware of this. If they're educated about it, they usually handle very well. It can be very emotional to have someone think you're nodding off because then they think you're relapsing and using again. It's, it becomes a big drama. If the woman is educated to expect this, if the medical team is educated to expect this, it goes very well. And it doesn't have to be this big accusation. It's a simple reminder of something that you've got to do at your methadone clinic. So that goes well. Um, somebody asked me, any, any questions about this first for everyone? Somebody asked me to talk about acute pain, and, and this is a, an important topic. Uh, this will come up for our pregnant patients who get in C-sections, but it comes up with some regularity. So I, we talked in those early slides with Dr. Dole that there's tolerance for the analgesic effect, which is basically a way of saying that when you take methadone every day, it doesn't do anything to help you not have pain. You have pain just like anybody else. If you stub your foot, uh, break your leg, get an operation, it hurts just the same as it hurts anybody else. Okay? You're not relieved of pain. I've seen doctors say they don't need pain medicines, they got their methadone, they'll be cool. This is absolutely wrong. That is absolutely wrong. So they're definitely pain sensitive. And if we're going to use opiates to relieve their pain, they're going to need it more, a lot more, because they are tolerant or resistant to the effect of opiates. So if someone has acute pain, you can still treat their pain with opiate medicines. You just need a much, much higher dose. How much? enough to make their pain go away. Is it too much? If they're breathing, it's not too much. Okay? But this is acute pain. We should not confuse acute pain and chronic pain. When someone has acute pain, they've had a C-section, an appendectomy, they need aggressive pain relief. And we can use opiates aggressively because we know they're going to stop hurting in a couple days. We don't have to worry about long-term effects. When someone has chronic pain, it's a whole different ball of wax. Whether opiates help or hurt chronic pain is a baffling topic. It's an interesting thing to talk about. But we don't necessarily want to give our, our methadone-maintained patients opiates for chronic pain. But we definitely want to treat acute pain, dental pain, surgical pain, very aggressively. Now, if you can, non-opiate medicines are easier to use because they're exactly the same as for people who aren't on methadone. Epidural is my favorite example. A pregnant woman's having a C-section or a vaginal delivery, epidural or spinal anesthetic works great. That's the way to go. That's what you want to do. If Tylenol will do the job, how lovely is that? Ibuprofen and NSAIDs, remember that these are NSAIDs are not safe in late pregnancy. Okay. But for non-pregnant people, those are good medications. So if you can use them, that's good. Toradol is a popular choice. A lot of our C-section patients get a shot of Toradol, which is the parenteral NSAID, uh, injection ibuprofen. Okay. These are good choices. But if you're going to give opiates, you need to give a lot. Yeah. What do you prefer for uh, dental pain? 
Well, well you, dental pain is a pretty vague category. Um, the, the worst kind of dental pain is, is the pain that you have before you finally decide to go to the dentist. And great relief of that pain will help you not go to the dentist and make your teeth worse. So I would say the first thing I prefer to dental pain is that you go to the dentist. And until you've done that, I don't like to give anything because you should go to the dentist. Once someone's gotten dental pain, I try to break it down into basically surgical type pain or not surgical type pain. And if it's surgical type pain, which basically means a tooth has been extracted, I'll use an opiate. Um, that's just a preference or a tradition. I don't know if there's a hard and fast answer. I don't think it matters that much. I think uh, we use uh, hydrocodone, uh, Vicodin here in the hospital because I know how to write the order. It doesn't really matter that much. Of course, in our setting, for those who work at ARS, you have to remember that every time you prescribe an opiate to one of the women in the treatment program, you're making a negative impact on the entire treatment community. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but you should be conscious of that fact because it really has an impact on the treatment community. But sometimes you have to relieve pain. Certainly if a woman's had a C-section, we do it. And for dental pain, what we typically do is allow Vicodin, uh, one, 5 to 500, 1 to 2 tabs, Q4, PRN, but not more than 48 hours. Why for? The entire treatment community. Because they'll know that somebody on our stinking and opiate at Oh, because of the other topic. A classic example. So we had a patient who had a migraine. She had a regular migraine. It was, it was a pretty obvious migraine, too. And she didn't get them very often, and she wasn't doing anything inappropriate. And it seemed to me at the time reasonable to give her, her uh, some Vicodin for her migraine. And so I did. And the next morning, everybody in the unit had a migraine. Okay. So you have to be really careful. And I think and this is not a reflection of methadone or even of treating patients with addiction. It's a reflection of the treat. When you're working with inpatient treatment communities, you want to have fairly objective measures. And, and I think always with pain, Acute pain is a short-term problem, and when you prescribe opiates for acute pain, you should have an expectation when this pain is no longer going to be there, because it can drag on forever. Okay. Any other questions? When you say it will affect the, you know, the, the milieu, as they say. What? The milieu. Yeah. Um, is it partly too that the rest of the group needs education? I don't, that, that's, a, that's a very good point. I, you know, I, I think that that's an interesting question. I think probably one of the counselors could ask better than I. The more people have insight into their own impulses, right, the better they'll handle things like that. And yet, if somebody triggers your craving for an opiate because suddenly you have a sense that it's available, it's, I think, very, very hard to be aware that that's happening. And often when people have a craving for an opiate, rather than have a consciousness that that's what's going on, in fact, they will believe that they have a headache or believe that their tooth is hurting to, to, to a, in a somewhat unconscious basis. So I'm not sure that education would help that. But, but when people are very successful in their recovery and they're able to be honest with themselves when they have a craving, if you're so good that you can you know, admit to another person when you're feeling a craving for opiates, you're going to be less likely, obviously, to have that tr trigger their desire to take opiates. Again. I guess what I was getting at is that not all the women have dental pain. Yeah. So if, if it was just part of their classes, just like you're telling them, you know, during the um, different trimesters, the yeah. first trimester that they're going to need a um, you, you, you know, maybe, although I'm not sure, you know, dental pain is a somewhat vague phenomenon by its nature. And, and I think that, you know, people understand about rules when they break the rules, you know? So I can tell people, these are the rules of the unit. You have to follow these rules. And then I'll be really shocked when they don't follow the rules. I know people understand rules when they cross the line and then something happens. So I don't think that being informed that you're only going to get pain meds if you get an extraction are really going to keep people from complaining of pain. To some extent, this happens on a vague, uncertain basis. I wonder how they'll respond. But to some extent, it's a somewhat unconscious basis. So I really don't think, I don't think we can educate our way out of that. I think we can re recover our way out of that. When people are really strong in terms of their 12-step recovery, I think it'd be less of a problem, but not not a problem. It's still a problem some. So, any other questions? Okay. I want to come back to this slide and ask you please, <coughs> as you're giving methadone to your patients, I'll go way back, to remember these numbers. Okay, so this is, this is our crux. This is where we're going to get burned, okay? So peak effect, four to six hours, right? So when you give the first dose or any dose, you want to wait four to six hours before you think about giving more, OK? Half-life, a day, right? And remember, five half-lives to equilibrate, right? And then again, your safe dose, you can probably give anybody 30, at least the first time, at least once, without getting in trouble. All right. Thank you. Yeah, of course.
What would you say is the biggest uh, misunderstanding that nurses have in terms of methadone that you've seen or heard? I'm, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, let me turn that around to the nursing staff here. What do you guys think? What's been the, the sources of confusion or, or error? I've heard from, from a colleague that a lot of people had trouble differentiating between what we do with the Suboxone, where waiting until they're in withdrawal is really, really important, right, to what we do with the methadone, where that's the opposite of what we want to do. We don't want to wait until they're in withdrawal. There was some confusion raised about giving methadone concurrently with other opiates. So I've done this once in a while. About a couple times a year, we'll get somebody coming here who's in really severe withdrawal vomiting aggressively. This is especially concerning to me in the third trimester, again, where the baby's more fragile, right? We want to settle down the withdrawal very quickly. I'm nervous to give methadone aggressively for fear of overshooting and overdosing the person. So we will sometimes use a short-acting opiate uh, in addition to the methadone for its short-term beneficial effect. So say, for example, I have a lady who comes who's 37 weeks pregnant. She hasn't had heroin in a day and a half. She's having severe vomiting and diarrhea. I might give her some methadone. She may or may not keep it down. But even if she keeps it down, it's not going to be working for four hours. That's a concern to me. And even then, it's probably not enough. But if I try to give her what I think might be enough methadone, I might kill her. That would be bad. So what I can do is give some dilaudid, some morphine. Those can be given IV, which is kind of nice if she's throwing up. right? But even if I give it PO, just like when we give Ativan instead of Librium, if I overshoot with a little bit of Dilaudid, I'm not really going to get in trouble. It's got a half-life of three hours. That's not so bad, right? So a lot of times we'll be combining the two. And I think that's by its nature kind of confusing. We're starting the methadone gradually, heading for stability. And what you're doing in that case is using a short-acting opiate just to kind of fill in that gap as that curve climbs up. In the community, when they start methadone, that's exactly what patients do for themselves. If you're in the outpatient setting, when you're starting methadone maintenance, they give you 30 the first day. And then you come back a day later, they give you 40 the next day. They might give you 50 the next day. And then they watch you for a while. It's probably not enough. Remember, 100 is the normal dose. So what happens while you're at 30 and 40 and 50 and 60? Keep using heroin, honestly. Use a little bit less, most people, or not quite as often, or not quite as much. And little by little, over two or three weeks, the heroin slowly fades away as the methadone levels come up. Now, we don't do that here, obviously. Although, again, occasionally if someone's really sick, we might use a short-acting opiate just for that effect. We can give methadone very safely here because we have the excellent nursing staff doing respiratory checks every four hours and counting their respiratory rate. So if we're getting in trouble, we're going to notice. That's a luxury the patients don't have at home. Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Okay.